before I go full screen, uh, I just want to make a few comments as this is a pre-recorded uh, video that was presented to a class uh, back in the spring. Uh, the work was done here because there were some comments made after the Starlink launches that several uh, observatories got firebombed or uh, photobombed, as well as several meteor cameras. And I uh, wanted to look at whether comments like, this is the end of meteor astronomy as we know it, uh, due to Starlink and other mega constellations, uh, whether, that, whether or not that was true. So uh, I was taking a class in small satellite uh, spacecraft engineering and design. And for my final project, basically I worked on this. So this, this is a pre-recorded presentation, <clears throat> which I'll launch in a minute here. Um, and it starts out at a very low level because most of the classmates that I had did not know anything about meteor astronomy, but it quickly gets into the deep into the weeds. And so you should all be able to appreciate this. So without further ado, let me launch this and hopefully you will hear the sound. All right, today I'm going to talk about the impact of satellite mega constellations on uh, meteor astronomy. Uh, there is a perceived issue that this could be a problem for video meteor science, uh, having so many satellites in space over a particular location on the Earth. Uh, I'll discuss the meteor detection uh, algorithms and geometry that's involved, some of the apparent angle rates you see of meteors relative to satellites some of the mega constellation characterization in terms of magnitude, density, and angle rates, and then how to mitigate uh, the issue as far as meteor astronomy is concerned using angle rate thresholding. This does not apply to regular meteor, uh, regular astronomy. So what is the potential problem? Well, meteors and satellites look very similar in video that is collected uh, by meteor astronomers. On the left, you see a multi-frame meteor. These are several frames uh, aggregated together. On the upper left, on the lower left, um, when you have a meteor shower, you have multiple streaks going across the sky over a period of time. When you look at the Starlink satellites, which is a new mega constellation that's going up in orbit, you'll notice that soon after launch, you see these streaks moving across these video meteor video cameras. Um, and in the lower right corner is what will happen with Starlink when all 12,000 satellites get on orbit. This would be an all sky view showing hundreds of satellites um, within, a, within the field of view. And that could be an issue as far as detection algorithms uh, for meteor astronomy and uh, the false alarm rates that, might, that satellites may cause. So this slide shows the type of meteor detection algorithms we use. We use basically a streak, moving streak detector, uh, moving line, looking for moving line segments the very similar behavior for satellites versus meteors. And on the right are basically the geometry considerations that we are concerned about in this discussion um, and how meteors, when they are away from the radiant, the direction from which they come from, appear to have longer streaks uh, relative to when you have a camera looking directly at the radiant, in which case the meteors are shorter streaks, range, the distance of the, to the radiant, the zenith angle from uh, looking straight up, uh, all play a part in determining whether meteors or satellites would be detected by, by a detection algorithm. For a high level begin height for meteors, this is an upper level HB of uh, the entry velocity V infinity. Uh, you can see a family of curves here, depending upon how far away from the radiant direction you are located. Certainly, there's no problem down at uh, below, above two degrees per second uh, at radiant distance of 15. But as a meteor, it looks like it's approaching you head on, which is radiant distance of 10 and 5 degrees. You can see that the apparent angular velocity on the focal plane is far more reduced, showing as these curves are lower uh, in the plot. On the left is a plot of the angle rates of various meteors, the fastest one being the black curve, sort of a typical sporadic random meteor is the purple curve. And then some of the slowest ones that are looking coming straight towards you are these various blue curves. You'll notice, also notice some of the bright satellites, such as the International Space Station, Hubble Space Telescope, and the Iridium flares that have typically been seen, run about one degree per second or lower, and basically are below almost all the meteors that we normally see. And so having thresholds 
which are these green lines, um, depending upon the resolution of the camera between all sky and telescopic, you may or may not actually detect satellites in most cases. The question is just how many false alarms will we get? Mega constellations uh, comprise uh, three at the moment. Uh, Starlink has plans for 12,000 satellites over the next five years, which and they do a launch insertion around 227 kilometers, which is the most problematic. Their phase three shells will be at 340 kilometers. Um, OneWeb is planning, was planning to launch 650 satellites, but they've gone bankrupt. But they had a very dark limiting magnitude of only eight, which is below the threshold of most meteor detection algorithms. And Amazon's Kuiper satellites have not been uh, determined as to how bright they will be. But the most significant concern will be these lowest, fastest satellites uh, around the 300 kilometer altitude. There are three major considerations uh, here. One is the magnitude of meteors and satellites. Another is the angle rate, and a third is the density in, in, in space. So magnitudes have been evolving for Starlink. They've been uh, working on trying to darken their satellites because of public outroar about how bright they were. So they had something called DarkSat, which is getting at or below some of the typical camera systems that are operated in the world, which are those green on the right, all sky cams, GMN, and EMCCD. Um, we looked at how the star Starlink satellites behave in terms of magnitude as a function of distance away from the zenith, and they behave in terms of change in magnitude very similar to meteors. So you cannot use magnitude as a discriminator. Fortunately, Starlink has tried to mitigate the magnitude problem by doing various things when they first get into orbit and in orbit rays. They've going to plan they plan to turn the satellites into a knife edge mode so they're reflecting less sunlight to the ground. Uh, their ka bain phased arrays, which are white, are going to be have now a dark coating on them, uh, but that had a potential overheating issue. And so they are going to install sun visors you know, starting in July 2020 to basically shadow those white phased arrays and reduce their reflective brightness. Here is uh, an example of the spatial density uh, in the sky of Starlink satellites, uh, which has been the major concern for both the astronomers and the public in general considering how bright some of the satellites had been. Uh, if you look at a spherical cap on an all-sky system, you could see as many as 300 to 400 satellites in one field of view. However, most all-sky meteor systems have a limiting magnitude threshold that essentially all these satellites would be invisible to. Uh, for moderate field of view, you could see anywhere from 1 to 12 within the field view at any given time. Again, we're sitting right about the limiting magnitude of the set sensitivity of the systems to below. But the most concern is the most sensitive systems, such as a telescopic EMCCD, and where we could possibly see one satellite every 30 seconds that is actually above the sensitivity of the collection system. So how do we discriminate uh, satellites from meteors? One of the simplest things to do is to actually look at the angle rate behavior. So on the right are shown the various curves for different height satellites. The uh, family of curves for a given color represent whether or not the satellite is moving uh, across your line of sight, which is the V perpendicular direction or along your line of sight, the V parallel where it's projected onto your line of sight. And that's basically at the top and bottom of each family of curves there. And as you can see, the uh, worst case scenario is Starlink right after launch when it's at 227 kilometers. It worst case, when it flies directly overhead, it can be moving at about two degrees per second. To get a handle on possible mitigation strategies for discriminating meteors from satellites, one could use a angle rate a threshold, uh, either a fixed value or one that's dependent upon the zenith angle, where you require having astrometry to do that. Uh, so we ran a high fidelity meteor simulation where we used uh, about a quarter million cams orbits and we knew the radiant elevation distribution, the begin heights, the velocity distribution, threw that into it and threw that into a um, simulation to see just how many meteors we could potentially miss.
Here is the net result from the meteor simulation. Uh, the percentage of mi missed meteors, um, if you actually use a fixed threshold of about 2.2 degrees per second or 2.0 degrees per second, we're talking in the 1.5 to 2 percent of meteors actually get missed. Uh, by using such a fixed threshold. You can actually drop that if you use a ang um, zenith angle dependent threshold uh, down to about the half percent level. What are the characteristics of those missed? Typically very, very slow meteors in the 10 to 20 kilometer per second range and at low radiant distance. And if you use the angle dependent threshold, the um, zenith angle dependent threshold, then you'll see, you can see that the uh, radiant distance is down 15 degrees, which means that you can pick up meteors anywhere from 20 to 90 degrees away from the radiant. So we're actually not losing very much at the low uh, velocity end. So what we found in con conclusion is that the video meteor astronomy, these mega constellations should not be an issue. We just need to use a proper choice of angle rate thresholding. Uh, either a simple fixed or an astrometry-based zenith angle dependence. Uh, there is some loss at low speed and radiant proximity meters, but percentages are really low on the order of 1%. And since there was an astronomer and a public outcry has forced the satellite industry to adjust their design, SpaceX is trying to address these issues, but they of course have to be concerned about heating and operation um, battery charging and that sort of thing, depending upon how they actually operate their equipment. Thank Can you. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank you. A real clap. You can also add virtual claps. So, guys, anyone with question or comment? 68. Oh, this is, I think, the largest number so far. As always, I do have a question. <laughs> Yeah, hey Pete, sure. um, Pete, are the, the satellites, the starting satellites moving randomly in the sky or do we have, say, certain directions so uh, moving, I don't know, from east to west, from north to south in a more frequent way that we could even put an extra filter, say it's not just a velocity threshold but also a directional threshold, something like this? Well, uh, to answer your question, the satellites are actually put into these shell orbits and so they actually follow each other, so there's like it could be anywhere from 15 to 30 in a particular shell, and then they shift over about every five degrees. So they're trying to cover the globe, basically. But the problem is, at any given location on the Earth, you could be on an ascending node, a descending node, or a crossing node. And so the direction in the sky from a given observer will appear more or less random. OK. OK. Thank you. Felix it was the second. Aha, uh -huh. so uh, I don't have to be the second. So I, I like uh, to uh, now, first of all, thank you. I think it, 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 a very great talk, I think. I, I want to comment a little bit on some the political aspect of this uh, Starlink uh, uh, problem, so to say. So it's very good to see now also a paper uh, on, on, on the impact on meteor observations. Uh, I would like to point out here that there is an, a very nice paper, but maybe Peter, you know that already, uh, on the impact of the satellites on all the VLT uh, telescopes in, uh, in Chile, uh, where they uh, also pointed out what, uh, what the damage is on the very expensive observing uh, time there. Uh, but moreover, I would like to tell you all that there is a very big meeting coming up from 5th till the 9th of October, led by the International Astronomical Union uh, to discuss the, the Starlink and all other communication satellite problem. And that is uh, a preparation for arguments towards the, Unite, uh, the United Nations. So it is played uh, as from the astronomy at the very highest levels there are now. So maybe this is also something to consider for IMO to 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 say our and share our opinion. Right. Thank it you. is a major. This is a major problem for the astronomers um, because even if you get down to seventh magnitude, eighth magnitude uh, during near twilight conditions or early astronomical twilight, uh, it, it's it's a problem for them and for their detectors, and it's very hard to avoid when you have so many satellites spread across the sky. Um, I, I'm, I was just trying to look at this from a meteor perspective. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world for us yet. So. <laughs> Dennis, you also raise your hand. Yeah, 
Hi, Pete. Great, great talk. Um, I just have a question. Did you look into the uh, like the divisors actually help? Because you said, oh, they're going to be deployed deployed in July. And, yeah. Uh, so this talk was given back in the spring when they, uh, I'd say, probably May timeframe. Uh, they just they had a delay in their launches, and so they just launched the visor stats in August, and it takes them about a month to get on orbit to, to the to the high operational orbit of 550 kilometers for this first shell. So they're just now going to be able to start estimating what the magnitude, the result magnitude was. So I haven't I tried looking up on the web just before we had this meeting. I could not find any information as to what they what they're predicting at this point in time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Any further comment or question? If there is none, then let's thank Pete again. Thank you.